So thankful for you guys after Thanksgiving. So we got so much wonderful stuff to talk about this morning. Let's thank God for the gift of learning Torah together. And then we will get right to it. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher bochar bonu mikoh amin v'nat hanlanu et torato, baruch atah Adonai, noten ha'torah. So good morning and happy Tuesday after Thanksgiving. Let me, uh, you know, we have, as always, we have two parts to the class. We have the president that Doris Kearns Goodwin talks about in that chapter that she talks about him. And then we have the connection to a Jewish text that, that, it, that this president and this chapter shares. I want to start with talking about her chapter, chapter 10 of Teddy Roosevelt. Let me ask it this way. Chapter nine was Abraham Lincoln during the throes of the Civil War. Chapter nine was Abraham Lincoln trying to figure out how to get the Emancipation Proclamation passed so that the sin and the stain on the American story could get remedied or begin the pro project of remedying it. And that's a lot of drama. Comes chapter 10, we have Theodore Roosevelt, it's 1902. And what we get is not, how do you abolish slavery? What we get is a coal strike. And here's my question to you. Did chapter 10, did the Theodore Roosevelt story suffer from anticlimax as compared to chapter nine of the Emancipation Proclamation? Or did you find yourself compelled by this story on its own terms, on its own merits, that this, you know, it's not civil war and it's not Emancipation Proclamation, but boy, is it interesting. Well, how did you guys come down generally on chapter 10 and the coal strike? Any takers? Uh, Linda Leffert. <laughs> I thought that actually in terms of something relevant to today and the kind of thing that can happen anywhere, anytime, it was in some senses more relevant to study in, in, in the sense of it's not likely a once in a lifetime kind of occurrence like slavery in the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and in fact, strikes and things like that, you know, happen all the time. So I thought in the terms of something relevant that could seem that you could uh, sort of uh, understand on, on a level of something that could affect your life even today or next year or whatever, I thought, in that sense, it, it was, that was what was really important about it. In other words, Linda, that this story of the anthracite coal strike in 1902 provided a lens with which we can see, um, with which we can see other events in our own time. So how did you see, like, how did you see this, this story from 118 years ago from 118 years ago. How did you see it um, foreshadowing issues that we face today? Well, I mean, I'm happy to let other yeah. people- Yeah, no, no, but just, I just wanted to engage your comment. That, in other words, it's not- I, I think that there, but it, there, in fact, even if you just want to talk about coal strikes. Right. Um, I, I'm, I can't, you know, I can't repeat chapter and verse, but there have been many situations like that uh, through the years since then. And um, now we have some resolved peacefully and many not. Facebook and uh, Twitter. So I, I'd say I'm not enough a good a student of history to, to mention the Amazon. actual dates, but I, I certainly remember that there were quite a few. Right. Okay, good. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it, it talks about, one of the things that struck me about this chapter, just to build on your point, is, and you can almost draw a straight line from that to 2016 to, to 2020, is the economic disparities between those who have so much, mm -hmm. what we call today millionaires and billionaires, what they called then plutocrats and robber barons and, you know, uh, the Gilded Age types. And the people who are in the mind, you know, the people who feel forgotten and not seen. And that was very much a central tension in 1902, the miners versus the, the plutocrats. 
And obviously in different ways, that tension is still very much with us. What were some other thoughts on whether this was uh, anticlimax or actually it held up on its own? David Kopelman. Yes, I thought it definitely held up on its own. What was interesting to me was when uh, Teddy Roosevelt offered mediation and the owners of the coal mines and railroads said, no, absolutely not. We're not gonna uh, do that with a union organizer. Uh, he then decided to take an action that was not justified by law. That is, he, what he threatened to do, what, what, what broke the back of the impasse was he threatened to actually take ownership or take over control of those mines. Uh, so here's a guy that was not just passively sitting back uh, he actively uh, made that threat and was prepared to go forward, even though there was no justification for it. It kind of reminded me of when the air controllers went on strike and uh, Reagan uh, basically said, fine, you're all, you're going to go on strike. Uh, there's a national interest in keeping planes in the air. We are going to fire, fire you all and hire new people, scabs, whatever you want to call them. And that ended the uh, impasse. So in this case, uh, Roosevelt said, look, this is not a fight between, say, uh, steel manufacturers. This is a, this is a uh, battle that's going to affect heating homes in, in the Northeast, and people uh, freezing to death. So I'm going to intervene and I'm going to do what I think is right, and regardless of whether federal law permits me to do it. I thought it took real courage on his part uh, to take that stance. Right. He identified a third interest. It's, it's about the miners and it's about the owners of the mines, but it's also about the public interest, yeah. that third interest. And that third interest needs a voice, and I'm the president, and I want to be that voice. Right? So, yeah, that, and that was some bold bold leadership. Uh, Peter Needle. Or Annette. Hi. Um, actually, for me, he both had the short view of we need heat, we need coal, but he also thought through the process. Um, he wasn't just you know, I got to do something and did it. He thought through the impact on the different parties and how he was going to act and how he was going to use, move forward with it. And I found that very impressive um, to read about. And, you know, absolutely, Ned. And I just want to double click on that because he was both as she told it and as she shared the story and you kind of felt it, form and meaning were converging. It was very meditative, deliberative, unhurried, unrushed, slow, right? It begins in May. It doesn't end until October. There's a, a spring season. There's a summer season. There's an autumnal season. And it's just so the opposite of our tweet, Twitter culture, where everything is now, yesterday, Twitter. And, and it could be thinking, it could be unthinking. It's usually unthinking. And it's just sent out here. And, you know, it. When, when his secretary of labor, Knox, puts out this analysis of the origins of the coal strike, and he wants to share it, and Knox says, you can't share it, and he doesn't share it, and then later he does share it over Knox's objection, but includes that objection. It's just so slow and marinating and deliberative, and in such dark contrast to our own uh, click right now culture. Um, yeah, so that was another thing that held up. Other thoughts about, about it? Yes, Andrea. I found myself mesmerized by his personality and the way he, his exuberance and the way he was able to both use it and manage it so that he had ways of controlling all that was seething within him and stand back and what all, everybody else has said, look at the entire picture and be, I mean, moving toward Dosa and our, the rest of our text, being very patient. But it, it wasn't simple. He used reading. He used athletics when he wasn't injured. Um, he, he just did such an amazing job. And I, I just was in awe of his ability to do that. Yeah, and particularly, Andrea, given that he was seriously injured right. in the middle of this whole thing. You know, to your point, he, it, it's hard to imagine that kind of thing happening today that a trolley would would have a traffic accident with the presidential vehicle. But boom, he's thrown 30 feet, the Secret Service guy dies, and he's uh, 
you know, he's off, he's, he's not, it's on doctor's orders to do bed rest. And then he's in a wheelchair and what a mess. And that's in the middle of this whole thing. Yeah. Um, so the fact that he has that kind of self-control, um, uh, you know, and, and there were times when the, the coal mine owners were very arrogant and very thuggish and very dismissive. And he checked himself and controlled mm -hmm. himself. Yeah, yeah. He was able to restrain his own anger. Mm -hmm. what? Uh, other sure thoughts so. uh, and, and impressions from this, uh, from this chapter. So what I, what I sense from the crowd is that um, this chapter held up, even though it was following the Emancipation Proclamation, mm -hmm. there was something very accessible, very relatable, kind of very prismatic of our own existence today. And that Theodore Roosevelt role modeled patience, he role modeled anger management, he role modeled emotional intelligence, the ability to check himself. He role modeled strategic thinking um, in ways that made it very much come alive. Any other thoughts or comments about Theodore Roosevelt and the anthracite strike? Uh, yes, Connie. Uh, Connie, um, if you can, you're muted. No, I, I yeah. got it. The, my iPad fell over. Of <laughs> Who, uh, I, was, I was really amazed that J.P. Morgan played such an important part in ending this strike. Um, that was a surprise to me. Say more. Why was that surprising to you? Well, because... I would think that he would be on the side of the uh, coal owners he as he was one himself. Right. But, but he managed to understand a greater good for a minute, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Look, I want to, yes, that's, and, and his, his uh, participation was pivotal. It was also interesting, one of the lovely takeaways is that while orphan, you know, while failure is an orphan, success has many parents. The way in which President Theodore Roosevelt broadly and generously credited everybody who had a part, including very much J.P. Morgan, and thank yeah. him for that. Um, one of the things that um, struck me about the end game, and I wanted to invite people's comments. I mean, this is just a little detail that I thought was so rich and so evocative. So they're finally coming up with, by the way, the, the end result after all of this sturm und drang, the end result after five months is exactly what Knox wrote in the Knox memo. Mm -hmm. We should move the hours from 10 days to nine days and there should be a, a neutral condition that can conciliate differences. I think Knox also had, there should be, when coal is measured, there should be representatives of both sides. I'm not sure that made it into the final, but 10 days to nine days in a conciliation process. And after all the strike and all the sturm and all the drong and all the drama, that's what they came up with. But what was interesting is on the, on the, um, the, the final group that was gonna come up with that conclusion, the miners wanted a labor representative. And the, the owners said, over my dead body, and that turned to be like such an emotional hotbed issue. Are we gonna have a union representative on this decision-making body that's gonna conciliate? And the owner said, absolutely not over my dead body. And the miner said, of course we are entitled to it. And they could not resolve it until Roosevelt just came up with that kind of genius idea. Let's not call it a union representative. Let's just call it somebody that the president gets to appoint, and he appoints a union guy. Um, and my question to you, and that was such a, it, I just wanted to, to put that under the microscope here because it, it was an insuperable issue, an insuperable problem, an irresolvable problem, an intractable problem. We must have union. You cannot have a union. We must have a union. We cannot have a union. The whole thing was going to founder on the shoals of this issue. And then Theodore Roosevelt comes up with the idea, you know what, let's just say I get to pick it. And then he picks a union guy. And, and they're okay with it. 
so what is that? What does that say? And by the way, the whole idea of this process at the end, as you know, was first suggested by the labor guy. Mutual. And they wouldn't accept it when the labor guy said it, but when they mm. got to pay credit for his idea and it was as if they said it, now all of a sudden the, uh, the owners of the mines were okay with it. So all that human stuff, anyone want to comment on that? On the role of ego, on the role of, of, of ego and of human uh, vulnerability and humanity in, in working this out? It was not about the merits. It was about ego. It was about feelings. It was about feeling seen and feeling validated and feeling threatened. Would love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, we have that now. <laughs> yeah, so Marilyn, say more. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I didn't realize I was on. <laughs> well, we have the, the superego uh, who refuses to um, concede, and, uh, you know, and, and I, many of most of his uh, Republican uh, supporters and uh, people in Congress and the Senate are you know, stroking his ego by uh, they're, they're sort of waffling. They're not calling Biden the president elect, but they're not saying it was rigged. I mean, it's, it's, it's all to uh, placate him. But there was something I wanted to mention about uh, Roosevelt though. Um, his use of history. He, he, he uh, really read um, to see if there was any other uh, issue in the, that had occurred that was similar. And then when he took his break, he likened it to when Lincoln was at the, the uh, soldier's home yeah. and yeah. thought about the process. He he, when he went off to his summer home, he likened it to that. Right, and in fact, in fact, there was kind of a, there was a little bit of a hint, a hint of the pandemic kind of in it, in that when he was injured and he had to go to his home, he was relieved that he didn't have to deal with the usual run of the mill stuff that a president has to deal with. And he could focus his time because he was injured and he was convalescing, his normal schedule didn't obtain, and he was just totally focused on the one issue he wanted to focus on, which was this coal strike. Um, and, and she draws, Doris Kearns Goodwin draws this comparison between Lincoln having his time away in where he thought in the, the veterans home, and of course, Roosevelt he, uh, doing the same in a different space. Um, last comment, Linda, and then we'll pivot to Joseph. Oh, I th thought it was also brilliant that um, what he did is instead of making it the Bar Robert Barron's and the Miners, he made it about the people. Right. The you third know. interest, the public so, interest. So yeah. once, and, 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 and even what you said about the names, in other words, it, it wasn't so much even that what they were asking for was so unreasonable. It was also a very small amount of money. But there was still this ca like a caste system almost, you know, the idea that the big shots had to sit down with minors and treat them, you know, equally and talking, you know. So it wasn't so much that they didn't think what they were asking for was reasonable. It was like, we're not gonna sit in the room with those people. We're not on the same level as those people. So right. once we made it about, forget about them, you know, we're gonna go home and you won't have heat. You know, it's about the people, it gave them an out. Right. It gave them a way to save their status as they felt it and still, you know, be willing to, to give a little. Yeah. One thing that, and the last comment on Roosevelt and, and the American context before we pivot to the biblical. Uh, one thing that I took away is that this tension between haves and have nots mm -hmm. is just endemic to our society. And this same tension recurs in so many ways. I mean, obviously it was an animating principle of the coal strike of 1902, the robber barons, the plutocrats versus the miners. But I was thinking about, you know, when Bill Clinton ran in 1992, it's the economy stupid. And he represents, who does he represent? The person who works hard and plays by the rules, right? Who does President Trump say he represents in 2016? the forgotten man, 
right? There's uh, the forgotten man. And that, that's who Nixon said he represented, the forgotten man. Uh, Clinton is the guy who works hard on plays by the rules. And if you ever go, I, re, I the moment that I realized that this is just an ever recurring uh, riff in American politics is uh, when I was at the Kennedy Library listening to the uh, debates in 1960, John Kennedy is arguing for the same thing. He represents the people who work hard and don't get paid, who work hard mm -hmm. and can't support themselves, who work hard and can't get ahead. Um, that seems that it's just an endemic, uh, ever recurring issue in American politics. And the reason is, by the way, it's an endemic and ever recurring issue in every human society. And um, mm -hmm. we, the, I, we've looked at this before, but it's in the Torah in Deuteronomy, uh, I think 15, 14 or 15, the Torah says there will never be poverty. And then the Torah says there might be poverty. And then the Torah says there will always be poverty. And that whole aspirational goal, we wanna eliminate poverty, but you can't because there's always gonna be an underclass. That's just human society. It's a Jewish problem. It's an American problem. It's all of our problems. Okay. Now, um, so I wanted my uh, point of departure to the Jewish piece was, uh, was the patience because Roosevelt waits from May until October when he finally hatches his plan that federal troops are gonna take over the mines. And that's his, you know, walk softly and carry a big stick. That's his big stick. And he waits five months and he waits and, and, and lets all kinds of less dramatic alternatives get tried and fail before he begins to threaten that one. So I wanted to talk about patience. Um, and I sent you a commentary from a rabbi who works at the Jewish Theological Seminary about patience. So I wanna just read a few paragraphs of this for our conversation. Uh, she's talking of course about Joseph. Joseph is very good at waiting. Not in his youth, of course, the young Joseph cannot help but blurt out his dreams, no matter how offensive they might be to his listeners. With the hard knocks of living, however, he learns the art and the wisdom of patience. Joseph spends 20 years in uh, Egypt before re-encountering his brothers. At least two of those years have been spent in prison serving time for a crime he did not commit. When his brothers unexpectedly turn up, he does not reveal himself immediately. First, he waits three days before dealing with them. The plan he then concocts to test the character is long and slow, requiring him to wait even longer while they journey several times to and from Canaan, taking days off, if not weeks off for each leg of the trip. How much easier it would have been for Joseph to have divulged his identity right away. Bible scholar James Kugel suggests that the Joseph character is an archetype of the ancient Near Eastern sage. He points out that Joseph is the only one of Israel's ancestors who was called wise. And throughout the whole story of ups and downs, Joseph reveals that cardinal sagely virtue of patience. Patience is a greatly esteemed virtue in Jewish tradition. A hot tempered man provokes a quarrel, a patient man calms strife. The end of a matter is better than the beginning, better a patient spirit than a haughty spirit. Don't let your spirit be quickly vexed for vexation abides in the breast of fools. It is one of the esteemed character traits acquired through Torah study extolled in Pirkei Avot. In the stream of Jewish practice developed in the 19th century known as Musar, patience is one of the key character traits we are to focus on in our spiritual, ethical, and emotional development Rabbi Menachem Mendel of Sadenoff defines the trait of savlanut, patience, as when something bad happens to you and you do not have the power to avoid it. Do not aggravate the situation even more through wasted grief. So, and, and so it continues. By the way, in Hebrew, patience is savlanut, and the root of savlanut is samach ve lamed, which means to suffer. So suffering is at the root of patience, literally in the Hebrew, saval savlanut, suffer patience. And the notion is that it is deemed a quality we want to cultivate to be able to be patient as we endure a trial that lasts and lasts and lasts. 
And instead of getting vexed and instead of snapping and instead of reacting, to be patient through it all. Uh, let me just pause there and invite thoughts, comments, questions about that. And yes, please, Paul. Yeah, I, uh, I have a little difficulty with the uh, prolonged patience. Uh, <laughs> the, end of, the end of slavery. It took 150 years uh, for black people to be patient and they sure didn't do it purposefully. They just did not have the power to, uh, to avoid uh, what was happening to them. And, uh, you know, now things are getting better, I, I think. Uh, but patience can sometimes be an unvirtue. You know, Paul, I, I think you're 100% right. Patience cannot, by the way, there's a great song. This is a beautiful song. It's in Dreamgirls. Um, and it's by Eddie Murphy called Patience. Just go, when class is over, Google Eddie Murphy, Patience in Dreamgirls. It's an amazing song. And I think the flip is patience is often used to justify an unfair and unequal status mm -hmm. quo, which, and, and the response is um, just be patient and your time will come. And in the meantime, uh, your time doesn't come. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think that you've nailed the creative tension about patience. On the one hand, we don't want to react. We don't want to, um, we don't want to make matters worse. And there is something mature and thoughtful about being able to restrain our impulses. On the other hand, Paul, you're 100% right. We don't want patience to be an excuse for legitimating and perpetuating an unfair status quo. That's the nub of the creative tension. Other, other thoughts on, on patients? Dottie. And Dottie, if you can unmute, please. You're still muted, Dottie, if you can unmute. Ah, now we can hear you. Okay. Good. No, I was just gonna say, when it comes to patients, Reading this book has been phenomenal. And you think about Abraham Lincoln, how he went to the troops. He exerted a lot of patience. But then if you think about Franklin Roosevelt, how he stalled the coming of the Second World War with the Japanese in 1941, he held true to what his patience. I haven't finished, as Lyndon Johnson, his was, he did so, I think, with the civil rights. But I think all these great men have that within themselves, rather than create unnecessary turmoil, war. And, uh, starting with Theodore Roosevelt, was the first time the unions, I believe, had exerted themselves to striking. Mm. And I, I can't remember. I mean, John, what was his name? John Lewis, the head of the union. What was it in the 40s? I can't remember all that. But I think that patience is a virtue. And these presidents have showed them. Yeah. It's something you have to have. I think it's what makes them great men. Yes. And by the way, you know, President Lincoln in the previous chapter, to your point, Thadi, was very patient in the rolling out of the Emancipation Proclamation. You know, and he waited for comments and he changed it and he, and he affected the timing of it based on the input. So this idea of being able to be deliberative and slow is, uh, and, and it's slow and wise go hand in hand and fast and impetuous go hand in hand and, and unwise, I think is also part of the, part of the patience project. Um, what, when you think about patience, let me ask you this question. We're now in month nine of this horrible season. And everybody says, everybody says, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. It's gonna get wor much worse before it's gonna get better. There's, I mean, there's gonna be a surge on top of a surge that, that Thanksgiving travel seeded another surge. Everybody, you know, there's, a, not to be alarmist, this is just all stuff that you know about if you turn on the news. There's what, a death a minute now? a death a minute in our country to coronavirus. And in the face of that, 
people are traveling and flying home for Thanksgiving and Fauci says there's going to be a surge on top of a surge. And at the same time, the other narrative is the vaccines are 90, 95% uh, effective and they're coming. So I would love to ask you to think about how does this quality of patience affect how you personally experience this dreadful season of month nine of the pandemic? Actually, today is December 1, so we can actually officially say it's month 10. We're in December 1. We're beginning the 10th month of this pandemic. How does patience affect how you experience this pandemic now in month 10? Let me just uh, see if there's, I'm missing anybody in the second gallery over here. Uh, anybody? Uh, Sandy. Well, somehow the nine months have gone by very quickly, although each day seems laborious sometimes and every day seems like the same, but we're into this for nine months now and there is light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, there is a vaccine coming. So they claim they're going to start in December. Um, we hope that things will roll out properly. So I think hope, optimism, as we talked about in the past, that we just have to hold on for a little longer. Um, yeah. and, and I think also sometimes just not listening to all the spin and all the news and all the things that are going on and trying to live your life deliberatively and um, just uh, if we've done it this long, we know that in three months, most likely there will be many people vaccinated and able to start to resume life in a more normal way. Right. And I think that that notion of light at the end of the tunnel and of hope and of faith, that is key to patience. I, I just wanna read two more paragraphs of Rabbi True's essay which speaks about like, how do you get to a patient place if you're not feeling patient? So she writes, this is um, the penultimate paragraph of the second page. Um, Faith then lies at the core of Joseph's patience. For more, the more traditionally minded, Joseph's words confirm that we, what we sense naturally in our hearts. God is good and God has a good plan that is unfolding even when we cannot see it. For the less traditionally minded, as well as agnostics and atheists, I would rephrase Joseph's point to make it a bit more universal. We are to maintain a solid faith that everything will work out okay in the end. As he sends his brothers off to fetch Jacob from Canaan, he admonishes, don't be quarrelsome on the way. Rashi understands this to mean that as we go about, we should not bicker over halakha, politics, or the past. Don't bicker. While going about the business of life, Joseph teaches his brothers and us, remain calm if or even when the road becomes unsteady for you. Underneath patience lies hope. In fact, kiva in Hebrew means both wait and hope, as I wait and hope for your deliverance, O Lord. So this idea of kind of cultivating a mindset of not bickering, not quarreling, not fighting. And if you believe in a God, if you have that kind of theological mindset that God is gonna to come to our rescue in the end, great. And if not, just this karma belief that everything will be better if we radiate more positive energy. And that therefore, uh, you know, the, the message here is, is to hope and to wait and hoping and waiting, believing in a loving God or believing in positive energy um, will get us to a better place eventually. And in the meantime, we hope and we wait patiently. Any other last thoughts, comments? David. Yes, uh, this language that uh, Kugel, they recite a tribute to Kugel about a, a Near Eastern sage patiently waiting because he believed everything in this world happens to a divine plan. And the talk about if you're waiting, things will turn out well, just have to be patient. You know, that uh, it kind of rings somewhat hollow to me. I remember attending services, I think it was a Catholic service, uh, uh, a funeral where a young child had died, uh, from, uh, run over or some, some, somehow he died prematurely. And the priest said, well, it's all part of the divine plan. We mortals, we can't understand 
the divine plan, but everything has a piece and it fits into this divine plan. I never bought it then and I don't buy it now. For example, uh, but everything turns out for the best divine plan. I think of the people in the Holocaust that they probably somewhere knew that sooner or later the allies would uh, overwhelm Hitler. But meanwhile, while they're patiently waiting and looking for some relief from, from God, or some divine spirit, six million are tortured, burnt, uh, uh, gassed. Uh, where did patience, how did patience and the belief in God help? Yeah, so David, uh, I it, it didn't. And, and so that's a problem I've always had with that whole concept of divine plan and divine intervention. It's always bothered me. Yeah. So David, the reason that you have that problem is that that's a serious problem and a serious flaw built into the system. So remember, I want to just revisit a principle of being Jewish. A principle of being Jewish, and this is over and over and over again. It might be the most important principle of being Jewish. To be Jewish means to be able to say that A and the opposite of A are both true at the same time. So I want to say that again. A and the opposite of A are both true at the same time. And the classic example of this, and Shai Held has taught it, I'm gonna bring this back to your point, David, in a minute, but the classic example of this is, um, are human beings worthwhile? Are human beings valuable? And Jewish tradition answers, yes, we're infinitely valuable because we're made with Selim Elohim in the image of God. Every human soul is infinitely valuable. And Jewish tradition answers, no, we are afar a fair, dust and ashes. We're dust and ashes. So both of these answers are true. We are dust and ashes, and we are made in God's image. And they're both true. A and the opposite of A are both true. And that is Jewish thinking. So should we be patient? Yes, it's better to not be vexed and not to react and not to fly off. And can patience be used to justify an unfair status quo? Yes, A and the opposite of A are both true, okay? Now, on your, on your question about waiting, et cetera, is there a plan? So if you think about the biblical story of, of Exodus, that's a story about God's salvation, correct? Absolutely, I mean, 10 plagues, miraculous plagues, the splitting of the sea. It's a story of God coming down with a strong hand and an outstretched arm and saving the Jews. Yeah, but the opposite is also true because how long were they slaves? 430 years. So for those 430 years, salvation came too late. What about the 20th century? We have Israel, yay. I mean, 100% of the people on this screen love, love, love Israel. Israel is the salvation of the Jews. Uh, that happened in 1948, a little bit too late for the people who died from 41 to 45. So was God involved in Jewish history? No, look, at the, at, at, at the loss of one third of our the murder of one third of our, of our people, was God involved in Jewish history? Look at the miracle of the, of, of the state of Israel's creation with the, all these hostile Arab armies. So I think you're absolutely right. And uh, that the notion that God has a plan and be patient is true. And the counter is also true uh, for the reasons you said, and that our response is to be able to hold both of those, A and the opposite of A. Patience is a virtue. Patience is not a virtue. God intervenes in miraculous ways. There is no God, and that God does not intervene, and there's just human suffering. Both of those are true at the same time. Um, so um, thank you. Any other last thoughts, comments, and questions? So your homework for next week is chapter 11, which is President uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt during the New Deal and uh, the buildup towards World War II. So we will pick that up uh, next week. And just thank you for another, I always love this class and uh, appreciate both engaging the American story and the Jewish values at the same time. I'll see you. Oh, by the way, by the way, by the way, please don't miss this. Put this on your calendar. Put this on your calendar for this coming Sunday. Uh, Micha Goodman is going to be speaking at 10 o'clock. Um, and he's talking about 
the book of Nehemia. So he's doing a series now once a month on Sunday mornings where we talk about, he teaches about the books that nobody's ever read. So if you've never, for, the first one that he did before Thanksgiving was about the book of Daniel. And if you didn't hear that talk, go online. It's in our, it's on our website. Mika Goodman on Daniel is a revelation. Even if you've never read it, if you don't know anything about it, other than it's this crazy book in the Bible you never read, his talk about Daniel is amazing. And the next book that he's doing um, about a, a biblical book that nobody ever reads is the book of Nehemiah. And I guarantee you, 100% likelihood, it's going to be amazing. And it's this Sunday, December the 6th at 10 o'clock. So we'll see you for Micha's lecture on Nehemiah. By the way, you know, we're just very, we have a special relationship with him. He's, he really is the greatest teacher of Torah in the world today. So we're just very gifted and very blessed to have this guy teaching us Torah once a month. And no other shul gets this. So um, what a beautiful blessing. And I hope you'll be there to take advantage of it. Yes, Sandy. So I have one other comment about patience and yes. sort of a uh, very relevant uh, situation is women's suffrage. They, uh, Woodrow Wilson kept telling them, have patience, have patience. And all through those hundred years, they were kept being told by leadership to have patience. And the women persevered and did not have patience. They did not want to wait. Yes. And, but it took a hundred years. And look where we are now at the hundredth anniversary. Right. That's, you know, that was Paul Kalis's point. But oftentimes, mm. patience is just an excuse for inaction. Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you, you'll enjoy Eddie Murphy's song in Dreamgirls called Patience. That's the entire thrust of his song, is that patience is just an excuse for inaction and perpetuating injustice. That's also true. That's also true. Thank you, guys. We'll see you on Sunday at 10 and see you again next Tuesday. Have a Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great week, everybody. Stay safe. Oh. Patient. We're doing our best. <laughs> Patient. It's coming. The vaccine is coming. <laughs>